Um, we've got uh, one big question. Uh, it's only three short verses today. I think this is probably the, one of the shortest passages I've ever preached on, which is great. Uh, three short verses, but uh, as you think about these verses, there is a lot in there, and we're going to be having a look at a, a, a closer look at some of the, um, the important words that are in these verses. But the big question uh, that is in these verses, I think, is, uh, well, the big question, sorry, that we, we face in relation to these verses is this. How does a young man's Christian faith survive in the world we live in today? How does a young man's Christian faith survive in the world we live in today? And not just survive, but how does it thrive in the world we live in today? Um, we have many challenges uh, facing Christian young men. Rod gave a talk yesterday at uh, Men's Brecky, a uh, great talk, um, which, uh, which outlined some of the challenge that is, challenges that we face uh, as men in, from the society, the world we live in. But as we think particularly about young men, I think there are a number of challenges. Um, technological advances are great, a great thing, aren't they? But along with technology, uh, pornography has become a thousand times easier to access. Real mateship is being reduced uh, to just following someone on Facebook. Um, our previous decades of uh, free love and divorce legislation have produced uh, such a watering down of marriage and the availability of easy divorce that makes lifelong faithfulness seem like just an option for young men. Sexual identity is coming to mean nothing. Uh, there's nothing special, we're being told, about being a man. And you should question your natural God-given gender and choose whatever feels right. Um, our young men today have grown up with parents from the baby boomer generation. And I'm one of those and a number of you are as well. And our baby boomer generation um, had a very me-centred attitude to life and uh, worship of money and materialism that has rubbed off on our young men. So that now uh, they're likely to say, well, it's my money and I'm entitled to any, own any good thing that I want. And I've got a credit card that's going to make it happen. Um, previous generations uh, had words that, they, um, that uh, they believed in like duty, loyalty and service. But that's been replaced by the ethic of this modern gen new generation that says if it feels good, do it. That's a big difference, isn't it? Duty, loyalty and service. If it feels good, do it. How does a young man's Christian faith survive in the world we live in today? That's just a few of the challenges uh, to, uh, to our young men. How does a young man's Christian faith survive in the world we live in today? How does it thrive in that world? And throughout history, um, there have always been pressures uh, on, um, that threaten the faith of young Christian men. And as Paul writes to Titus uh, in these verses that we're looking at today, uh, th th it would have been no different. There would have been pressures on young Christian men. And we're not told exactly what those pressures are. It's interesting that um, as Ralph preached last week on the first uh, five verses um, of this passage, uh, you see some of the pressures that, um, in the words there that he addresses to older men uh, and to older women and to younger women. And it seems to be pointing out some of the particular pressures that they face. But here... Um, it, we're only just given one sentence of very general advice uh, to, how to how to help young men. And it's there in verse 6. It seems like very simple advice, doesn't it? Have a look there, verse 6. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Now, I, I think the um, full stop's in the wrong place there. I think the full stop should be after the next two words. So I'm going to... Um, can you press the button for me, please, Sarah? Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I think it should read like this. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. So that, seems, that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Um, but I want to have a look at that word, first of all, encourage, the word encourage. Because the, the, the word encourage, like it's a good word uh, to describe how we can help young men, um, but it could mean uh, something a bit stronger. The Greek word that's behind this word encourage uh, has the idea of entreating. Or, as I've got there, pleading, uh, pleading with young men. 
And another word, to exhort or to urge them along, uh, to fill them up with encouragement, to urge them. And it reminded me of, um, of being at the footy. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go to a Roosters game, Roosters versus the Gold Coast. And, and when you're in a football crowd, that's what you do. You exhort the team, you encourage them, you urge them along. You call out things like, smash him, uh, <laughs> run faster, um, you know, uh, and then you, you might entreat the referee, you know, you go, come on ref, that bloke was offside, um, give us a penalty. And that's what, that's what, those, those words are what we do at the football. We exhort, we urge the players on to, you know, to do bigger and greater things. And I think that's what, how we should be thinking when it comes to young men. We need to be entreating them and urging them. We need to rally behind the young men in our church and urge them along. Now, it's not pestering them, okay? It doesn't say to pester them or to harass them, but to encourage them, to entreat them and exhort them. What are we to encourage them to? Well, to be self-controlled in everything. Pretty simple advice, isn't it? When you think about the lists he's given for older men, older women, younger women, what about young men? He just says, be self-controlled in everything. At Bible study during the week, someone said it's probably because they can only think of one thing at a time. Um, but <laughs> this, uh, this idea of self-control uh, has come up uh, before. You see, it's back in verse 2. Uh, Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled. Uh, for the young women in verse 5, uh, it says to be self-controlled and pure. Uh, and it's an interesting word, this uh, word. We think we know what self-control is, don't we? That means don't eat too much chocolate. That means you know, don't get angry, uh, don't drive too fast, um, don't, don't re retaliate when someone uh, annoys you. Is that just what self-control is? Well, the, word, the Greek word that's behind this word self-control is an interesting word and it talks about having a sound mind. Having a sound mind or being in your right mind. It talks about uh, being, oh, no, not that one. It talks about being clear headed. And I was trying to think of how we put this in, a, in modern you know, idioms, modern language. Uh, and I would say it's more like about thinking straight. Uh, my dad used to say, Have you got your head screwed on, on the right way? Did that ever say that to you? Have you got your head screwed on the right way? Uh, are you on track? And it's the opposite to being muddle-headed or confused or unsure, but clear-headed, disciplined, and in that way, self-control. So that's the sort of word he, when he talks about self-control, he's talking about having a clear mind about things, being able to make your own decisions, not letting other people make your decisions for you, but making your own decisions based on what you know is true. That's a big challenge for young people and maybe for men in particular, for young men in particular. I know it was a big challenge for me. Uh, as a young man, my years at uni um, were a huge challenge uh, to be clear-minded and to be on track. Uh, the big question that we face uh, when you're young is how am I going to make my way in this world? And at uni, there were so many different forces and pressures coming at you about what's right and what's wrong, about what's good and what's bad. And it's interesting now that, that um, some of the um, writings, uh, articles I've read recently are talking about the fact that we don't think in those categories of right and wrong anymore. People in this generation uh, don't think of necessarily right and wrong. They think about pain and pleasure. What brings me pain is bad, and what gives me pleasure is good. Now, as you think about that, does everything that gives you pleasure, is everything that gives you pleasure good? It's not, is it? So it's completely different categories to the way we've thought in the past. And for young people today, as they're trying to work out, what, how am I going to make my way through life? Where am I headed? Uh, how am I going to make my way in this world? They've got all these different categories to think about and different pressures coming in on them. So how are we going to urge them on? And it takes us back to verse 1, doesn't it? Where Paul says to Titus, and this verse covers every generation, every person, uh, but he says, 
you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Literally, you must speak healthy teaching. You must speak healthy teaching. Um, an example of this uh, recently in our church, I, can, uh, I was thinking about this example last night, uh, where a um, man, I'm going to have to call him middle-aged, he's a little bit younger than me, uh, a middle-aged man, um, went to a young man in our church and he spoke to him and he spoke clearly and rationally to this young man. He didn't get, didn't, didn't get um, you know, up, worked up or, or emotional, but spoke clearly and rationally uh, to this young man about the consequences of his actions and his need to get back into a relationship with God and to make things right. And to me, that was exactly what we need to be doing. It was a great example of what Paul is encouraging Titus to do, to entreat, to plead with them. And that's what he was doing, to exhort, to urge them, urging him to have a sound mind, to think straight, to be disciplined and self-control. That's what we've got to be doing with our young men. But to do that, we need to know our Bibles, we need to know God's Word, and we need to work out how it impacts our lives in every way so that we can share that with young men, so that they can live for God in everything, be self-controlled in everything. So we need to have the right words. But you notice in the next verse it says that if our words are not backed up by a committed, faithful, uh, sorry, consistent, faithful Christian life, then our words are going to be empty and they deserve to be discarded. Have a look in verse uh, 7, the rest of verse 7. I uh, said, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Full stop. Set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. You see in those words, as I read those words, the, the power of example struck me. The power of example. And we know that power, don't we? When you see something lived out in a person's life, that's much more instructive than just having words to rely on. And he talks about the example there in, uh, in verse 7. He says, set them an example by doing what is good. In fact, uh, there's a word that's missing there, a Greek word that's missing there. It says, by showing a pattern of good works. Now, that's a bit different, isn't it? Think about that. Doing something good versus showing a pattern of good works. When it's, as you think about that word pattern, I was trying to think of other words like blueprint or a plan, a life plan. We need to, set, uh, we need to have a pattern of good works. By, uh, set an example by having a pattern of good works. When I was um, uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, decided I was going to build a TV cabinet. I think it was going to be for Natasha's birthday and then it ended up being for the next Christmas and then it ended up being for Mother's Day, I think. It was about 12 months later, I finally got it finished. But uh, as, I, as I went to um, build this TV cabinet, I had an idea, or we had an idea, um, we came up with an idea of what we wanted it to look like. And, um, and, and as, I, uh, as I had that idea in my head, I needed someone who could help me. I needed someone who could uh, help me to make this idea become a reality. And I went to uh, Richard Lukensmeyer's shed and uh, Richard helped me to, um, to think through the, pl the pattern, the plan uh, that I had for this, uh, helped me write down the measurements, uh, helped me, demonstrated to me how to cut um, timber accurately in a way that I'd never done before. Uh, he helped me with, um, to teach, he taught me about joinery and lots of things that I needed uh, to, for this, for this uh, thing to become a reality, this idea. But then uh, as we progressed, um, we needed some structural integrity uh, to this unit because as you can see, it spans uh, 1,500 mils or a metre and a half, uh, that span. And to have weight on it, it was going to sag over time. How are we going to make this thing so it would last the test of time and wouldn't sag? So we had to uh, call in Howard McBetridge um, to help us to understand uh, how this, how you, how you could make it in such a way that it wouldn't sag, and I want to say it hasn't. Uh, thanks to Howard's brilliance, uh, it, was, it was great um, to be able to work with him, wasn't it, Richard? 
really good. Now, those two men, for me, were living examples of the plan that I needed for my TV cabinet. See, the two, the two men, I had, this plan, I had this idea in my head, but those two men were the living examples of the plan that I needed to build this uh, TV cabinet. And as young men face this question, what's my plan for life? What's the plan for my life? That what, how can I live a life that means something? How can, how can I live a life that achieves what I was made to achieve? A life that will stand the test of time. They need to see that pattern in others. They need to see that plan worked out in the lives of others. They need to see the pattern of good works in our lives. Over the last holidays, I, I listened to an audio book um, called... Uh, the Barefoot Investor, you may have come across him. And um, uh, Barefoot Investor just talks about a plan, uh, how to plan your finances for your future. Very common sense advice, um, straightforward, uh, and I really enjoyed listening to the book. But what he's doing there, I realised last night as I was thinking about this, he's showing you a pattern. He's showing you a pattern of how to plan your finances for your future. But along with that pattern is the message, I've been there, I've done it, you can too. And that's his message right throughout the book and he keeps saying that. I've been there, I've done it, you can too. This is the pattern uh, that he is setting to go along with his words. You see, if young, how can, sorry, can young men see the pattern of a godly life in you? Can young men see the pattern of a godly life in you? And before you get dejected about your failure, because we all fail and we all sin, and you might be thinking, well, how could I ever be a good example because I know I've failed? I can't teach them anything. Interesting words I read this week in a book on Titus, and, uh, and it was a conversation uh, between two women, and one woman was saying, I just can't, you know, I, I can't be a good enough example because I fail and I sin. And the other woman said to her, Jill, we're called to be models. But we're not called to be models of perfection. We're called to be models of growth. Now, that was really interesting words. It made me think, think really hard about that. We're, called to be, we're not called to be models of perfection. We're called to be models of growth. And Christians need to be maturing. I've often said, if we're not maturing, if we're not growing as a Christian, then we're going backwards. I don't, think you can, I don't think you can stand still or stagnate as a Christian. If you're not maturing and growing, you're actually going backwards. And so, and, and this whole chapter is about how Christians mature, isn't it? Teach older men, teach the older women. See, you, you might think just because you know, I'm old, so I don't, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, I've done all the growing I'm ever going to do, but that's not the way it is. The Bible says we need to keep growing. Put your hand up if you've already reached perfection. No, I'm waiting, but no, no, no one's put their hand up. We all need to grow. You can be, you can be 89 and have three weeks left to live and you've still got growing to do. We're not called to be models of perfection. We're called to be models of growth. And that's what our young men need to see in us. People who set an example or can be an example or a pattern to others of a life of good works, how to live as a Christian and how to grow as a Christian. And verse 8, uh, the, rest, sorry, the rest of verse 7 and verse 8 backs this up uh, by talking about how we teach young men. And you notice, though, uh, read through those words, it says, um, in your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. It's interesting. It doesn't tell us what to teach young men. It doesn't tell us what to teach young men or what to say. But it does tell us what we are to show in our teaching. See that? In your teaching, show integrity. 
seriousness and healthy, upright speech. Because if young men see the opposite, if young men see in our teaching flippant words, deceitful praise, divisive arguments or selfish boastings, then you're leading them up the garden path, aren't you? Leading them to a, a worthless life. Young men need to see in our teaching integrity, seriousness, healthy, upright speech. We are, see, we are called to be a people, a church family, whose teaching is full of integrity and healthy instruction and godly encouragement. That's what we're to do. So that anyone who opposes us will actually be laughed at. They'll be ashamed of their slander. See, the Bible doesn't give us programs to implement to encourage young men. It doesn't, get, doesn't say, you know, if you just set up uh, you know, Friday nights or Thursday nights and, and, and do this and do that. It doesn't tell you all those things, does it? But it gives us the principles that we need. And uh, if you've heard uh, Steve Bailey speak last week in his testimony here in church, or if you heard Rod Crawford speak yesterday at the men's brekkie, or if you heard John Westendorp speak at the men's brekkie two months ago, you would have heard great ideas about how we as men can encourage each other and how you can help young men to grow in their Christian faith. I'm not going to cover that ground again. If you want those ideas, talk to those guys because they're, they're great ideas. But I was challenged by an article during the week uh, written by a minister in Sydney. Uh, he said, your kids need to know how you became a Christian. It's important for you, our young men and our young women to know how we became a Christian. And this came to this guy as his, his, young, uh, sorry, his 12-year-old son uh, asked him, Dad, how would you become a Christian? This guy's a minister and, he, and he, he'd never shared that with his kids, he realised. He said, I've talked about Jesus to them. I've read the Bible with them. I've prayed with them. I've answered all their questions. But I've never actually shared the relationship, how I came into a relationship with the living Lord Jesus. And he said these words, Was I merely explaining how things work, telling them what the Bible says, showing what a passage means, giving them the answer? They need to see that my faith is a deeply personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that's what our young people, our young men, need to see in us. A living example. And it's a challenge for each one of us, isn't it? Are we pleading with them? Are we cheering them on? Urging them on? Are we showing a pattern a blueprint for good works. Are we models of growth to our young men? Does our teaching come with integrity and healthy words? We have a great opportunity to build a generation of strong Christian men. Uh, in our church, we have... Um, young men in numbers that many churches would die for. I was thinking about that as we sing our last song and looked up and five young men playing music today. In most churches, it's one old woman sitting at an organ. We have young men in numbers that many churches would die for. That's not boasting. That's just the way it is. Are you seeing the opportunity? Are you seizing the opportunity to help our young men grow? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you um, that you have brought us to a relationship with you. But Father, we know uh, that it's not something we keep to ourselves. Father, we know that we need to um, be an example to, to set, have a pattern of uh, good works and of faith in the Lord Jesus that our young people will look at and they'll be able to copy. 
Father, we pray that you would help us in our teaching, in our encouragement, in our urging our young men on, that you would help us as we seek to set them on the right track, to give, help them to have a clear mind about where they're heading in life, to know what's true, to know what's honourable, to know what's praiseworthy, to know what's right. Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to see that we have a role in our church in helping our young men grow into strong Christian men. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.